asked to speak today about craft and uh, what the word means. So this is sort of a little bit of my story uh, and how it relates to the idea of craft and what craft means maybe to me, what it could mean to you, what it means to Kentucky, and what it should mean to our community. And I think I go here. It says, we to Michael Sheffer, that's me. <laughs> Now you can tell I'm not a graphic artist, right? Because I put this little PowerPoint together with my daughter, who's 13. She knows how to use PowerPoint. I do not. Um, so Kentucky has, I, I call it, that's my little title, Kentucky Crafted. We, we use that title a lot. I didn't come up with that, right? You've heard that phrase before, Kentucky Crafted. What does that mean? And in Kentucky, we're, we're one of the states that has a lot, we dedicate a lot of our uh, our infrastructure, not a lot, but we dedicate, we have organizations that are dedicated to preserving the history of our craft, to promoting crafts. Uh, we have big craft stores and craft uh, galleries. You can go to Kentucky Crafted, you can buy wholesale, you can buy retail. We do these big shows. We have potters, we have weavers, we have painters. We have John sitting in the back there, he's one of my favorite painters. Um, we have, so we have this long tradition of, of craft. We have a lot of writers in our community. Uh, we've got Crystal Wilkinson, we have Frank X. Walker, and as a state, we have Wendell Berry. I mean, so when you think about craft, you think about writers and potters and weavers and candle makers and broom, broom makers, and uh, I had to ask myself, what the hell did they ask me to do this speech for? Well, we're filled with craft, with craftsmen and craftswomen. Why me? Uh, why, why a cook is, is cooking a craft. So I looked it up online because nobody reads a dictionary anymore. And it said, craft an activity involving a skill uh, in making things by hand, a skill in carrying out one's work, skill in planning, making, or executing. So my, my by that definition, yes, I think cooking is a craft, but not all cooking is craft. And not all food is food craft. Um, my kind of food is made by hand. It may not be my hands, but I got a lot of hands at this point in my career. And everything that we serve, we are making by hand, using locally raised, whenever possible, raw ingredients. So what does that mean, really? I mean, that means no frozen ravioli, no cheese sticks, no jalapeno poppers, uh, no boxed macaroni and cheese. I'm not knocking these things. By the way, some of them populate my own pantry, but because I have a 13-year-old daughter. But I'm just saying that's what my kind of food is. That's what making something by hand means. And in our communities, we have to confront the fact that we eat a lot of factory-made food. Not all the food that we eat is made by hand. And I think that's a question you could ask yourself. How much of what I eat is made by hand or made by my friend's hand? So we might buy a lot of things that other people are making for us. We might buy something from Sunrise Bakery. They're making that by hand. We, we might buy something from Country Rock Sorghum. They're making that by hand. Gents is making their smoked honey grapefruit syrup for my cocktails. You know, we're make, we might buy a bottle of um, our favorite bourbon, and that's being made by hand here in Kentucky if you buy the right bourbon. See, it's all about that. So that's my kind of cooking, and I guess by that, by that definition, we're, we're a craft. The interesting thing about cooking, though, is it involves a lot of skill. And skills uh, involved in running restaurants really have nothing to do with cooking. And that's why so many times you'll hear me, he'll, you'll hear me say that restaurants cannot be the food culture of Lexington. If Lexington uses only restaurants to define its food culture, we have a bankrupt and empty and very poorly, very bad, 
very poor nutrition food culture. We cannot have our food culture defined by restaurants. Now, restaurants can be a part of our food culture. We can lift up the food culture. We can direct the food culture. We can do a lot of things through restaurants, but we cannot be the food culture of a community. So for all you youngsters out there, you got to start cooking. you got to start cooking. you got to start buying your food from the farmer's market. you got to start making dinner for friends, having people over. And then every now and then, you got to go out to eat at one of my restaurants. <laughs> this skill set, you know, because the whole definition here says it's an activity involving skill. So it's a multitude of skills, and what I'm going to try to express to you is like the different skills that I feel like I have competency in, in cooking and in running my business. And the two are separate. That was that point. So how do you get to the skill part? Well, there's this guy, Malcolm Gladwell. I like him, but people debunk him all the time online. You can make up your own, decide, the, your own minds about this, but he has this theory about the 10,000 hour rule. Have you all heard of this? I'm sure you have, everybody's not in their own. So you gotta have 10,000 hours of this dedicated practice in any given thing in order to, to be competent in it. He says world class. I think it takes a hell of a lot longer than 10,000 hours to be world class, at least in cooking, okay? 10,000 hours is only five years of basically an average work week. Uh, that's nothing to a cook. I don't even let you work the line at Holly Hill Inn if, you've got, if you don't have five, five years in. I mean, you, five years is nothing in cooking. I don't know what it is in web design or technology, but it's nothing in cooking. Um, I think I started cooking in 1987. Were some of you at least born in 1987? <laughs> Sorry, cooking in 1987. <clears throat> and by 2000, I think I had 40,000 hours of cooking experience. So I think that's 13 years, is that right? Yeah, so 13 years at about 40,000 hours. And in 2001, I bought the Holly Hill Inn with my husband, Chris. And I think we've had that now for 17 years. It's crazy to think about your life like this because it feels like five minutes to me. But I think since I bought the Holly Hill Inn in 2000, I probably have another 53, 54,000 hours in. Now, some of that's not cooking, right? Now I gotta, I gotta do personnel management, I got cash flow management, I got ordering, I got inventory, I've gotta write recipes, I've gotta do, develop menus. So about, I'm about 93, 95,000 hours in my working life right now. By the time this Zim's place opens up, I'll be closing in on 96,000 hours by the end of 2019. 2020, I'll be at 100,000 hours. I'd like to retire at 100,000 hours. <laughs> but, uh, so I calculated all that because I thought, oh, that'll be a cool talking point. And then I sat there and went, what the hell does that even mean? What the hell can I even do? Um, in so many ways for myself, and I know for every person here, I feel like I'm just getting started. And that led me to this quote, the life so short, the craft so long to learn. Hippocrates said that. In antiquity, I love the cuisine of antiquity. Um, and I think that's true. For a lot of us, we feel like just at the point when we finally get it figured out and we're not so stressed out running like a chicken with our heads cut off all the time, it's time to stop. So it's a long process. And what the lesson is, is that uh, the learning is the journey. It's the hours. So make them as full as you can, right? Enjoy every step of it. Be doing something that you're passionate about. And that's what makes it craft. That's what makes it, your, gives you the ability to even have the stamina to develop the skills that you need. Um, this is a little bit about me. <laughs> I don't think you can see those pictures. But the picture here, that's me and my mom. I was a Girl Scout. I grew up on State Street, across from the UK Med Center. My dad was a professor there. Now nobody lives on State Street, but back in 1972, it was a nice neighborhood. <laughs> and I was a baby, and then, I don't know, I was some kind of, oh, that's me and my little sis and brother on the very end. So I grew up here in Lexington, I went to UK. I was on the debate team. In the center photo, that's my debate coach, Roger Sold, who's my business partner, been my business partner for 18 years. He's a short guy, long beard, bald head, looks a little bit like a gnome. When you see me with him, that's my best friend and business partner, Roger Solt. We're standing next to uh, Dr. J.W. Patterson, but as you go down the line here, you'll see that's my debate partner, David Brownell, myself, and Governor Collins. And in 1986, we won the National Debate Tournament. So this whole idea of practice and skill development 
came to me very early in life through debate, through competitive debate. Because I think by the time I was a senior when we won the national tournament, I had, I had 12,000 hours in debate practice. So I knew at a very young age that practice equals success equals skill development. And that's how I've guided my entire professional career. That's one thing I love about cooking. Cooking involving cooking practice equals success. I like that. So then my husband did that cute graphic. I moved from Kentucky to New York City in 1987. And that's Chris and I. Look at all those little cute things moving for him. That's so cute. That's, that's us on our graduation day. You can't really see us too well. But I met him on the first day of chef school. He's a New York boy. I never thought I'd come back to Lexington, that only we would marry. And then uh, my, I promised my mom I'd get married in Kentucky. And then we'd move back to New York City. But once I got home, what I like about this place, I, I wanted from the very beginning to cook for family and friends. I got sick of anonymity. I'm tired of anonymity. I'm tired of it in Lexington, too. But I wanted to cook for a community. I knew at the very beginning, when I got back here, I knew I wanted to be part of a community. I knew I wanted to build a community. And that's a big part of what I've tried to dedicate my professional life to doing. Restaurants can do that when they're run the right way. Not that I even run my restaurants the right way all the time. Um, so we returned to Lexington in 1993, and this is just a, a little shot of a few of the places that I worked in, because remember, all this time I'm working my butt off. You know, it's no joke to go to the Culinary Institute of America. I'm not trying to aggrandize it, but attendance is mandatory. If you miss a class, you fail, and you can't move to the next class until you complete the class you're in, and you have to pay to take that class again. It's not like, you know, you're waltzing through three credit hours of Sociology 101 and then showing up for the final exam, which is what I did in college. It, it, it was... It was significant. But my first job here was at Dudley's, back at the old Dudley's, and I'm a big fan of Debbie Long's, because she was the only one in Lexington who would hire me. Just graduated number one in my class from the CIA. I couldn't get a job in this town. She hired me, and that middle picture there was when I was the sous chef at Dudley's restaurant, peeking out from the old basement kitchen shelves there. I also worked for Harriet Dupree, another close friend of mine. I kind of opened her business up for her. And uh, then we opened Emmett's restaurant for um, the Coons family. And that's the final uh, picture down there. And, and right after that, we opened the Holly Hill Inn. We got the opportunity to buy the Holly Hill Inn while we were at Emmett's. And that was in 2000. So I'm developing all these competencies. And I'm working really hard. And I'm working really hard every day on the line of a restaurant kitchen. And when I started with Emmett's, I had to, I had to start writing menus. And as I was writing this lecture, I started thinking, OK, this is how do we develop these competencies? I got 40,000 hours in this working life from 1987 to 2000. Really, what was I good at? I wanted to pick a couple of pictures that demonstrated this. My kind of cooking is not recipe-based. You can ask any of my staff. I despise recipes. That's why I can't bake anything. I hate baking. I hate reading a recipe while I'm cooking. I either memorize the recipe and know it by heart, or I don't want any part of it. And here, I think you can kind of see that. The first picture is a picture of poached eggs. Don't make poached eggs from a recipe. You can't do it. If you don't know how to make hollandaise, you ain't going to make it happen. If you don't know how to poach an egg, you're not going to be able to do it. Do you see what I mean, the difference there? But to make that zucchini bread, you've got to follow a recipe. I, can't make, I hate making zucchini bread because I, I can't follow a recipe. The the, underneath that is uh, my old beaten biscuit break. Beaten biscuits, too, are, there's a little recipe. Thankfully, it's simple, but it's based on feeling, on touch, on rolling, on, on how it should go. So there's an intuition that you develop about cooking. And you cannot develop your intuition without practice and involvement. So if you do not practice and develop a skill set, you will never trust your intuition. This is what I tell young cooks all the time. That's true in business. And in business, if you don't follow your intuition, you're going to go down. And most people don't understand that. Business is about good intuition. Good intuition is about confidence. Confidence is about practice. And all of it's related somehow to craft. <laughs> We talked about mentorship. This is Mr. Charles Logan. He's uh, 85 years old now. He restores biscuit breaks. He taught me how to make beaten biscuits. He criticizes the hell out of my biscuits all the time. But, and there's a play to those beaten biscuits. And again, just trying to communicate to you technique. And now you can see how cooking technique informs culture and can bring generations together. Because that's if we're basing it on technique, if we base what we know about cooking on technique, we're, calling, we're learning hand-to-hand hand is what we call it. I love that phrase. We're learning hand-to-hand. Hand. My hand is teaching your hand. 
If we're just learning cooking from television or from BuzzFeed or from Vice or from Munchies or from a cookbook, we're learning from media. We're not learning hand to hand. But when you come and cook with me in my kitchen, you're going to learn hand to hand. And that's the best way to learn how to do anything is hand to hand. And that's what Mr. Logan taught me, and that's the point of that slide. Now, that's a glazed ham, perfectly glazed ham. Y'all can't see it for anything, but it's beautiful. <laughs> we had a photo shoot for that ham that went seven hours. <laughs> but, but I wanted to tell you about the ham because the ham is another example of, you can't read a recipe and know how to cook a ham. You can stand there with your cookbook and read it 10 times, and if you've never cooked a ham, you'll second guess every single step you make. Now, what temperature is supposed to be the oven? Now, when do I put the orange juice on? Now, how long do I leave it in there? Now, am I supposed to glaze it first? Now, how do I glaze it? Right? Because you're reading some damn book, and you don't know, and they don't know. You've got to be able to practice and make that ham, and that's what we call technique-based cooking, just in case you didn't get the point. And that's craft right there. Now, that's not a pot, and it's not a, it's not a wall hanging, it's not a painting, but it's a damn good ham. And a lot of people can sit around a table and eat that ham together. So that's one set of skills. That's cooking skills. And as you get older, your cooks get better than you are in the kitchen because you start to get a little fuzzy-headed now and then. And also, you just don't have time for the drama anymore, and you kind of get sick of washing dishes and telling people to clean up. So what you begin to realize through the whole journey is that it's all about people, that your people skills are actually more important than your culinary skills. People are everything. Everybody loves to say in the restaurant business, location is everything. Bull, bull, hockey. Location isn't anything. People are everything. You can set up a shack, have great food, and, and uh, put it in the middle of nowhere, and you've got a smiling face there every time people come. And I did that. It's called Wallace Station. When we opened Wallace Station, Nobody, people said, are you insane? And I'm like, yeah, I think so, because it lost money for like five years straight. <laughs> but that had more to, more to do with my financial management. Now, you know, the problem for Wallace is it's too busy. It's about people. It's about your staff. Your hospitality begins with your staff. It doesn't begin at the front door with that customer. It begins by empowering and loving your staff. And then they have the power and the love to welcome people with a sense of hospitality. So I think I got about 20,000 hours in on personnel management over the years. So some of my 93 hours is not all cooking. I had to learn really fast how to manage people. And menu development and collaboration, that's another skill set. Uh, this is my friend Bridget, Bridget Prather. She was a guest chef at Holly Hill Inn. I think over the years, I have never run the same menu two times in a single week in 17 years of operating the Holly Hill Inn. For those young people out there, you need to come out to that restaurant. Because to me, you have not had the authentic taste of our region unless you've eaten. I'm not being arrogant. I'm just saying this is the truth, the way I see it. That is a rare space that will not be around forever. It's 153 years old, and we've never run the same menu twice. Because we're hand-to-hand -hand teaching food and serving food in the restaurant. That's what that restaurant's about. It's a horrible business model. The worst business model ever. Pick a 150-year-old home that needs a hell of a lot of work, put a restaurant in it. What the hell? You know, terrible. <laughs> but it is my love, my passion, my true heart is at Holly Hill. I'm not the chef any longer. So don't come there looking for me. I'm all over the walls, and I'm in every nook and cranny, but I'm not in the kitchen. You know, I have a new young chef in the kitchen who's killing it. Why? Because I spent seven, eight years standing next to him, teaching him everything he knows. <laughs> That's not even true. He's a fantastic guy. Uh, I don't want this to go global and get back to him. Um, but I, one of my great loves is when you have someone like that, it's young, it's at the beginning of their career, they're dynamic, they got all these ideas. I love that kind of collaboration. Don't come to me thirsty. Come to me bursting. I'd like to do that with them. They come back to me with, well, what about this? But what about this? But what about that? And I go, no, 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 maybe, yes. So that's part of what I spent 93,000 hours on. Well, that's Chris and I today, a little fatter, lot, but, but happy, and Holly Hill. 
that was our first restaurant. Now we kind of move into the business section. Like, how do you run these, this big business? People say, I don't know how you do it. Remember the other slide. Whenever you ask me, how do you do it? Remember that slide. People are everything. My people that work for us run everything. So this is our restaurants. We started with Holly Hill. Then we opened Wallace Station. Wallace Station is 15 years old, July 11. Uh, but it's actually 100 years old, but just since I've owned it, it's 15 years old. Holly Hill Inn will celebrate 40 years as a restaurant next year, and I've owned it 17 years. And then after Wallace Station, we opened a restaurant called Cleveland's in Versailles. We had to close it so the picture didn't make it on the thing. <laughs> Every restaurant isn't successful, and I think they, people need to know that we're, oh, I'm out of time. I'm, but, no, 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 I'll finish up. I'm not going to just cut you off like that. <laughs> all these restaurants are part of a family because they all informed each other. So every step in the, in the walk, every step along the path builds on the step before. As long as you're moving forward, even if you're going by an inch, you're still moving forward. You're still learning. That's something my father's always said to me. Don't change. Build on what you already know. Even if you go a little to the left, a little to the right, hopefully more to the left, you, uh, you're building on what you know. You're building on what you know. The last restaurant in my career is going to be right here. You're looking at it right now. It's going to be where those lights are in the windows. That's Zim's. Zim was my great-grandpa, Aaron Rufus Zimmerman. It'll be uh, the best of Windy Corner and Wallace Station, affordable family dining in a folk art setting, um, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So come back for breakfast in, in October. We'll be open. We're going to have old-fashioned scallop placemats and everything, but grits, country ham, biscuits, lots of coffee. And by the way, Sal, I love you. Thank you so much. I, I know he was here earlier. Thank you so much for that coffee. He bailed me out. He bailed me out. I, I, I called him yesterday and said, we can't brew 150 cups of coffee. <laughs> Can you help us? Okay, I, my final slide is, I, last week we had talked about mentors. I kind of lost a hero of mine. I didn't know the guy. But Anthony Bourdain died last week, and this was a great quote that I said. It, he says, maybe that's enlightenment enough to know that there is no final resting place of the mind, no moment of smug clarity. Perhaps wisdom is realizing how small I am and unwise and how far I have yet to go. And that's the way I feel about myself. Thank you, guys. I'll, I think we have time for questions.